It was early autumn in 1999, and I was camping with friends in the West Country, UK. There were about six of us. We had set up our tents alongside a little stream, but decided that we would walk the mile or so back to the local village and have dinner at the local pub. It was a beautiful evening, roughly 6pm, still bright daylight and still warm. We were walking down the country lane with hedgerows and pastures beyond them on either side of us. I was walking with my friend Dave, chatting about whatever. We were at the head of the group, with the rest a few metres behind us. Dave is on my left, and as we're walking and talking, we come to a metal gate, also on the left, leading into the field. There's this farmer leaning against the gate with a genial smile on his face. He looks friendly and, to be honest, harmless, maybe in his 50s or 60s. But what struck me most was what he was wearing. He had on rough cotton or maybe woolen dark brown trousers, an old style white cotton shirt and an old scruffy black waistcoat. He seemed to be staring and as we draw, he says, evening. I replied. Dave looks at me and then looks to our left. In the meantime, the farmer has said something about the weather and I reply that it's perfect for camping. We don't stop walking or slow our already slow pace. I want a few metres away, turn to Dave and say, did you see what he was wearing? Like it was the 1940s or something. Dave turned to me with a confused look on his face. Who? Who are you just talking to? I turn to gesture to the farmer, but he's not there. And judging by the rest of the group behind us, who were just passing the gate themselves, nobody else saw or interacted with the farmer. I've had various experiences throughout my life that I can't logically explain. But today, I'm going to tell you about the house my parents bought when I was in my teens. This isn't about one encounter like most of the other posts will be, but rather a number of the more memorable things that happened to me in this house. This is in the UK. I don't know many details on how my parents acquired a large Victorian three-story house in St. Nicholas Road. What I do know is that a builder had bought it and was converting it to apartments, and he ran out of money. So the bank foreclosed and somehow, my parents acquired it for much cheaper. But it was a building site. The builder hadn't done much work to the ground floor, but the other two floors were pretty much just shells. Structurally, the house was absolutely fine. It dated from around the 1880s. My dad asked me if I'd stay there, so that people could see it was occupied, so that people wouldn't break in or squat. I set myself up in the main living area with a camp bed, and all was good. I had electricity and hot water, and despite its condition, the house was sealed from the weather. My first few experiences were hearing doors being opened and closed in other rooms. Of course, when I got there, I wouldn't find anybody or anything untoward, or indeed any reason for the doors to just magically open or close. These were proper old woman doors, and not likely to move in a draft. Not that there were any drafts in any case, the builder had replaced all the old window frames with good quality UPVC framed double glazing. The sounds of doors opening and closing when I was alone in the house became a common thing in my three years of living there. After my parents had put right all of the builder's work, decorated, and the rest of the family moved in, my parents, my sister, and briefly my brother, until he got a place with his girlfriend. I ended up having the top floor to myself. The house had six bedrooms. Four bedrooms and the family bathroom on the first floor, and two bedrooms and a sort of kitchenette area on the second floor, which was the top floor, my floor. One room faced the street and was a bit noisy due to the traffic outside, and the other overlooked the back of the house and was much quieter. I set myself up in the back bedroom, but would soon be woken regularly by an animal panting next to my head. I found out after a while that the last occupant was an old man who had a German shepherd dog. Another thing I often heard in that room was creaking wood and a rustling noise, like paper. I figured that someone used to have a creaky wooden chair or a rocking chair and would read the newspaper here. I tried moving to the front bedroom, but the noise of the traffic was too much in the summer with the window open and having it closed made the room unbearably hot and stuffy. So I soon moved back into the back bedroom, 
and talked to the room about the dog waking me up, and to please try to keep him quiet. I was still woken occasionally by panting noises, but it was a lot less frequently. One of the weirder things that started happening, I actually wasn't aware of until after about two years of living there. It had started slowly and built up over time. It was only when I moved out that I realised what was happening. I started to hear voices, several, like there was a group of people in the room with me, and they were having a conversation or quiet get-together. I don't know why, but to this day, whenever I think about this, I picture them in 1930s style, but I've nothing to base this on that I'm aware of. It could be a couple of words. A snatch of conversation, usually male, but not always. And background noise, like glasses chinking, or a record player or similar party style noises. And laughter. I would often just hear good natured laughter with men's voices. I talked to my dad about this because it was becoming a weekly thing and I honestly began to wonder if I was going a bit mad. He told me he hadn't heard voices but did admit that he had had other things happen to him that didn't happen to me. It was only when I moved out and into my new place that I realised after a couple of weeks that I hadn't heard any of the voices. The realisation made me laugh with joy. I wasn't losing my marbles at all. The ground floor was made up of the two main living areas. The large kitchen, the laundry room, and at the very back of the house, a room that had been converted into a shower room and toilet. I have no idea what the room was prior to the conversion. I was in the kitchen one day, I think it was a Saturday, and I clearly heard a young female voice say, the potatoes from the Crescent aren't as good as they used to be. The Crescent is the local high street of the area, about a five minute walk from the house. The voice was clear as crystal and came from the adjoining laundry room. I dashed in there, but of course, there's nobody there. I stick my head in the shower and toilet room, but that's empty too. I, of course, am alone in the house. This one is a tale my sister told me. Her and her boyfriend at the time had rolled in from the pub late one Saturday night, and were in the kitchen unpacking the takeaways they'd grabbed on their way home. When her boyfriend casually says to her, Oh, I don't know you had your grandmother staying with you. Sister gave him a weird look and said, Both my grannies are dead. To which he replied, Then who the fuck is that? They both look into the hallway and there's nothing there. Boyfriend squealed and screamed and ran into the laundry. Once he calmed down, he told my sister how he'd heard someone go, Shh, that's him. He turned towards the noise and there was a white-haired old lady looking over the banister of the staircase in the hallway and scowling at him like they'd woken her up. My dad was as much a sceptic of the paranormal as I am, or was, and admitted that a few strange things had happened to him. He told me of when he was preparing food in the kitchen one time and put a utensil he was using down on the countertop, only to reach for it again 20 seconds later, and it had gone. He had looked on the floor and started looking elsewhere, trying to figure out where it had gone. He found it in a mug of water in the sink, and knew for a fact that he didn't put it there. Another one he told me was that he was reading or doing paperwork at the dinner table in one of the living areas when the door slammed shut, which started him out of his concentration. He looked up to see the handle turn downwards and the door to open again fully. There was nobody on the other side of the door. This was back in 2006 and 7 in the UK. I had bought a house with my girlfriend at the time. The house was an ex-council property built in the 70s. It was alright. Needed some very minor work done to it, but that's all. The girlfriend and I moved in straight away and without drama. However, after a couple of weeks, we noticed things would go missing, only to reappear after a few days on the second to bottom step of the stairs. Usually, it was kitchen implements, and I always got the blame, as the girlfriend didn't believe in ghosts. This became the standard state of play for about 12 months. Something would disappear. She'd get the strop at me. I'd quietly ask the house to please return the item, because I'm in the shit again, and she withholds sex when she's annoyed at me. Item would reappear a few days later, and then all would be well for a month or six weeks, until something else disappears. Rinse and repeat. 
And then one day, her phone disappeared. This is back in 2006, remember? So mobile phones were nothing like the supercomputers they are now. It was usually in her pocket or her bag, and she couldn't understand where it went. We searched everywhere. It was switched on, so we tried calling it but couldn't hear anything, even though it was doing so at my end. Of course, it was my fault. I quietly pleaded to the house to return the phone, but as usual, I was ignored. It was a Saturday morning when it reappeared. For whatever reason, the girlfriend was up before me and had gone down for brekkie and to put the kettle on. I heard her go, oh, and come back up the stairs immediately, clutching her phone. Why did you put it on the step? She asked me. I explained that it's not me doing it. We looked at her phone, full battery. Unusual, it had been missing for five days and dozens of missed calls from my mobile and her office number. And one outgoing call was made. We tried redialing it, but it was a dead line. It wasn't the last thing to disappear before we sold the house in 2010, but it was definitely the most memorable. My family and I moved into a new house my senior year of high school. And my room was in the basement. My room in the last house was in the basement, so it was no big deal for me. There was another room next to mine that could have been another bedroom, but everyone else decided to stay upstairs. My family put our piano in that room and used the closet as extra storage space. Every time I'd walk past that room, I was filled with inexplicable dread. It's a feeling I still can't describe properly. I always felt like there was something on the other side of the door that was just waiting for me to open it. If I would walk by that room and the door was open, I would walk up and shut it immediately and being sure not to look inside. No other room in the house or any other houses I've had lived in has given me this feeling. I felt a presence that was extremely negative in that room. It came to a point where every time I went into my room, which shared a wall with that room, I felt uneasy watched, unsafe, and overall very negative. I would have written it off as me being paranoid or anxious about moving into a new house after living in the same one most of my life. However, I wasn't the only one who expressed these feelings. A woman who cleaned our house refused to clean that room one day, and when my mom asked her why, she said that the room had an extremely dark energy. I wish I knew what was going on in that house. Items would disappear and reappear. Lights would be turned on when I was sure they were off. Doors would be open I was sure had been closed, etc, etc. I won't ever go back into that house my family moved to after about two years. So a little backstory. This happened on Sunday around 2.30 or 3 a.m. I work nights mostly, so I'm usually up at night. I was the only one in my household at the time, and I live in an apartment complex. I was crouched in the doorway to my balcony at the time, petting my rabbit because he wanted some loving, and I let him free roam on the balcony. Anyways, as I said, I was crouched and since there isn't any railing, no one would be able to see me. And even if they could, there's a giant tree that covers half my balcony. And the light was off since it was so late at night. That being said, I heard a giggle and then my name being called. It was being called in a coaxing kind of way, like someone trying to get you to come over. I stood and looked around at the other balconies and then the ground floor and didn't see a single person. I then thought I might have called someone by accident because the voice almost sounded like a friend of mine and I had just plugged in my phone. So I closed the door and checked, but I hadn't. The moment I closed the door, I heard the voice say my name one last time in an angry tone, and then silence. Thankfully, I haven't heard it since, and I told my sister, who then sprinkled salt in the doorways, and told whatever it was that it wasn't welcome in the morning, in case it was a spirit, I guess. I really can't explain it, I've had a lot of paranormal-like experiences in my life, including always feeling like someone's watching me at night and hearing noises when I'm home alone since I was young. But I've never outright heard my name being called like that.
I live less than half a mile away from a densely wooded area with an 1800s era graveyard which I frequently go into, mainly looking for mushrooms and reptiles and such. But the past few times I've been, and the very last time I went, have been exceptionally strange. I'll start with the most interesting thing to happen first. I had gone to this graveyard roughly around 2pm, again, looking for mushrooms. I was roughly 400 feet into the woods, far past the graveyard, which is only about 20 to 30 feet from the entrance to the woods, when I decided to head back to my house. So I began to walk back toward the way I had entered, when I started to get the feeling that I was being watched. Now being in the woods, that wasn't quite a normal thing. It usually just ends up being a deer or owl or something. However, I quickly realised it probably wasn't. When I finally got back to the area of the graveyard, the woods went dead silent, which isn't a good thing. So I ran pretty quickly out of the woods. The moment I stepped out of the woods, I looked to the right of me and I saw a trail that I hadn't seen before. So I decided to, quite stupidly, go into the trail to see what was back there. And there wasn't much. Just rusted cans and trash everywhere. I had stood back in this area where the short trail took me when I heard a very strange sound. It sounded almost like a frog, but very high pitched and almost tonal, like someone singing. That made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. At this point, I sprinted out of the woods until I was nearly back to my neighbourhood when I looked back. And when I did, there were three small orbs that seemed to stare back at me. At that moment, I just said to myself, oh, fuck this and ran as fast as I could back into my neighbourhood. The only other strange thing to happen back there is the Sasquatch trees, which are bent over trees that I know for certain that no human could have bent. The trees back there are over 20 feet in height and quite sturdy. And the time where I was back in the graveyard with my mother, and we both heard a distinctive whoop, like the stereotypical sounds you hear on the Bigfoot documentaries, it was really quite strange. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born, and me and my family had some old family friends over at our house. We had been hanging out nearly all day, and it was beginning to get around the time of sunset. Me and my friend, who I'll refer to as A, went on a walk down to the ponds in my neighbourhood, and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes, just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we began the short walk back to my house, when I notice a star in the sky, which appears to be moving. I tell A this, and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway, looking up at the sky. We watch the star for roughly five minutes, and then we notice two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. A pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see it, sadly. Nearly immediately after A had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars and formed a large triangle. The stars then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping and then proceeded to move at a speed which I have never seen before, away from each other and disappearing into the night. Both me and A were visibly shook up, based on the reactions of the people at my home, and when we tried to explain what had happened to them, they shrugged it off as just us not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, so does A. pitch black humanoid figure, wearing neat clothes and hair by the seams. I can't see detail besides the outline. He's about six feet, and I'm the only one to have seen it. First time was when I was like five or so. I saw the figure very clearly walking towards me down the hall, at my grandmother's house interstate. And after I froze, I ran off and it disappeared. But I don't know if it's because I was a kid or what. 
but it gave me a very bad feeling. Then again, when I was about 12, I was looking out my back window into the paddock behind my house. The figure was walking horizontally to me and then turned and continued walking towards me. I stared for a second with that same scared feeling and then went to run off. But after a couple of steps, I decided to stop and look back and it was gone. Those are my two major experiences that I know wasn't just me seeing things because I watched it clearly. I've also found that my mother has seen it standing behind me whilst I was on the couch and it promptly disappeared. Turns out my mum's old friend saw the same thing happen. A black human-like figure behind me and just disappeared. On a separate occasion. And she didn't know about the possibility of there being something following me. So I'm not the only person to have seen the figure. It gives me a bad feeling, but that could be just because I'm seeing something or what. My mum reckons it's this ghost named Gary that we encountered when I was a newborn following me. It woke mum up in time for my appointment and told her his name. But he was good and didn't feel it. I've had other occasions where I think it's around because I get that same feeling. Scared and weirdly aware of what's around me. As I've gotten older and moved, it seems to be less apparent. But I still have occasions where I think I might catch a glimpse or feel its presence. I don't know if, like me, you have a big family. My nan had eight children, and she herself had many siblings, one of which was my great uncle P. Uncle P was my mum's favourite uncle. By now he was in his 90s, but happy and living life to the full still. I'd met him as a child, of course, but living in different cities meant that as I grew up, I heard a lot about him, but never actually saw him. Mum said that Uncle P always asked about me. He wasn't too bothered about the others because I think I was always fascinated by him. And when he called my mum, I would always butt in to say hi and ask after him. Sadly, he recently passed away. But the months leading up to his sudden death, I had a heavy feeling. Me and mum would talk about going to see him. Work, etc. always got in the way. But I felt very strongly about needing to meet him as an adult. So we made the trip. Previously, We had tried to meet up with him, but things always got in the way, like his illness or just last minute cancellations. He opened the door and straight away pulled me into a hug, saying this is the one I've been waiting for. We spent the next few hours laughing and talking about his life and our joint interest in the paranormal. He told me many of his own stories and encounters, including the significance of white feathers. As I left, He had light tears in his eyes and he said to me, you were exactly as I hoped you would be, and more. He wanted to show me an old picture he loved, but as he pulled it out from behind his dusty cabinet, a white feather floated down to the floor. We both laughed out of shock and amusement. A couple of months after that, he passed away due to sudden sepsis. So I was visiting my mum shortly after the death, and I was outside in the back garden having a smoke on my own. An overwhelming feeling came over me, like nostalgia. I felt happy but sad as Uncle P popped into my head. I went back inside and closed the door but froze. There it was, a white feather stuck on the door handle. Let me tell you now, it was not there before I walked out. Trust me, I would have noticed. You couldn't miss it. And my mum would never have stuck it there. I used to dance. We practiced in a studio on the top floor of an old theater. I was about 12 years old and it was me and my best friend at the time that would go every Saturday together. We arrived late one Saturday. Usually at the bottom of the stairs, you pay, but there was nobody there. We thought we must have been really late. So we ran up the two flights to the doors at the top that enters into the cloakroom. But as we got there, we just saw darkness through the small round windows. I peered in, seeing nothing but black and looked back to my friend, who shrugged, but suddenly her eyes widened as she gazed beyond my shoulder. I followed her gaze back to the window, where I locked my eyes onto a man. 
He had red hair and his eyes were wide and piercing green. He was somewhat see-through, like what I'd imagine a mirage in my mind. I felt like I couldn't look away, but my logical brain took over and searched for a poster or something that he may have been reflecting from, but there was nothing. I looked back and he blinked. I heard the rush of frantic footsteps darting down the steps as I realised I had been left alone and my friend had escaped. I took one last look at the man who at this point, I swear, had grown a smirk in the corner of his mouth. And that done it, I followed suit. My heart was trying to break out of my chest as I sped after my friend. We didn't stop running until we were outside in the light and warmth. I said to her, what? What did you see? And she said, a man, I think. You see, it was different to looking through a window and seeing an actual person. This guy was faded. It was like a projection. We rang our parents from a payphone and asked them to come get us ASAP. We later found that the dance training was cancelled that week, but we both didn't get the memo. We lost contact after a few years, but would still follow each other on social media. One night, my curiosity got the better of me, and I messaged her asking if she remembered what happened that day, or if it was just a cause of my childhood imagination. She confirmed that she still had the image of the red-haired man burned into her memory. Every time I think about him, I feel a chill. I actually wish I would have stayed longer, but I shudder what would have happened if I had opened that door. Since I was 11, I used to hang out with my little sister N and my childhood best friend M in this abandoned manor. Our parents didn't want us to go there because it's said that the place is used for satanic rituals. I didn't believe in the existence of Satan and things like that, so we kept going to the manor. At 12, I started to feel depressed. Long story short, I was severely bullied and my parents were in continuous fights. I hated being home and I started to go to the manor alone or just with Vicky, my female Doberman. That place started feeling like home and I started to study there, to draw or simply relax while the dog explored the little wood that still surrounds the manor and the castle nearby. Before believing in the paranormal, in that manner I experienced things. These two are the more interesting. In the manor's hall there's a chair. Sometimes we sat down at the main entrance, with the chair on the other side of the wall. And a moment later, it was near us. I never got scared. And knowing that we weren't the only kids going there, I thought that the chair was already near us and we were so used to seeing it on the other side of the room that we just didn't acknowledge it sooner. Nothing paranormal, right? Even when we clearly saw the chair in one place and a moment later it was near us, I kept believing in the it was already there, we didn't see it thing. I often heard a woman crying. Being a skeptic, I used to think I was imagining it, but a few times N and M heard it too. I always left the place with them because I was the older. I thought it was some human stranger and I wanted N and M to be safe. Even alone, I heard the cry and my dog always tried to go towards the chair, waggling his tiny tail and basically doing the same she used to do when I cried. I kept believing in the presence of a homeless or just weird woman and went home for safety. After a while, I just ignored the cry and stayed in the manor. I started to believe it when I was 13 or 14 years old. I was at the manor with Vicky and I had three knocks on the third floor. The place was surrounded by trees so I thought about some animal dropping or something. There were a lot of squirrels and it was a possible explanation. After a few minutes, three knocks on the second floor, nearer. It kept going like this and the knocks were coming towards me. My dog started growling aggressively. I know I should have run away. But I was curious and stayed there until the knocks were coming by my side. Only then I ran away after doing my research and learning that three knocks mean that a demon is being disrespectful towards the Holy Trinity. Well, even as an atheist, I didn't go to the manor for almost a year. After that day, I started to notice more things. Weird noises, objects moving. 90% of the time, I explained it logically 
but I was unable to rationalize the things that started to happen when I was 15. And I just restarted to go to the manor. Always with someone and never inside the manor now. Me, M and N started to see something weird in my garden. It was like a black human silhouette. My father saw it too. I stopped my visits to the manor once again when I saw that figure in my home. Sulfur smells in the bedroom. Something knocked inside my sister's side of our wardrobe, giving her nightmares. We share a room to this day, and she said the noise has stopped when I was away from home. Now something knocks over my clothes and knocks inside my side of the wardrobe. We have 13 cats, but every time I hear something, I never find a cat inside the wardrobe. Me and other people saw a young woman crying at the window of the manor, before vanishing into thin air. Something chased me the first and only time I visited the manor alone, at 18 years old. I once created a story on that manor. I always felt a female presence, I call her Elise, near the chair and a male presence, I call him Lord, in one room. So I wrote a story about a young woman who was married to a traveller. They loved each other so much that she killed herself when he was murdered while travelling to Germany. My mother told me that it's what happened to a couple that lived in the manor decades ago. I'd never heard that story before. My friend Jay saw the crying woman while visiting the manor with friends. They begged me to come there because I know the place like the back of my hand and I found them scared as hell. I told them not to enter the Lord's room and one of them never listened. I'm able to enter the room without problems but strangers always feel bad or sick. This guy vomited and had a bad fever shortly after being in the room. I started feeling really affectionate toward the crying woman. I feel like crying whenever I think about her and my sister said to me this morning that she saw a woman sitting on my bed. I never told her that I feel someone sitting on my bed at night because I always thought I was imagining it. I don't know what to do people. I don't know what logical explanation I could give to those things and what to do in general. I feel like I should help Elise and my friend Jay. She's a sensitive and a green witch. And to me, and said to me that the tarot said that there's a ghost who needs company. Do you have some advice? Some logical explanation? Should I just believe? Some background information about my house. My house is over a hundred years old. As a kid, I was also so scared and afraid of the dark. I was scared easily, and usually when I'm home alone, I would leave on all lights and leave on the TV so I don't feel so alone and scared. I'm not 100% sure if someone has died in the house, but whenever I was alone at night, I always had a feeling like I was being watched like someone was staring at me. This event took place in middle school for me. I was up late because I was the type of kid that never does his homework when he gets home, always waits till last minute. And that's usually past my bedtime, which is 10 p.m. But this time I had an essay due in the morning. So I was up working on my essay that I needed to hand in the next day. My mom recently just went to bed and the rest of my family has been in bed since 10 p.m. It was only me on the dining table working on the essay just a little past midnight. It could be closer to 1am but I'm not 100% sure. As I'm working on my essay I start to hear a little rattling noise coming from the backyard door. It seemed like it was the doorknob. Someone or something was playing with the doorknob and making it rattle. I was very scared but this essay was more important and I had to get it done so I just continued to write my essay. As the sound starts to crescendo slowly and get ever so louder, I start to panic a little bit and go check it out. Not fully check it out, but just enough to see the door and see what is making that sound. A little layout of my house so you can understand how I was positioned. From the dining room table where I was sitting to the kitchen sink was about eight feet. The kitchen was almost like a small hallway with an island counter and shelves on one side and on the other side was the sink, fridge, stove and the little kitchen counter. Down the end of the hallway is where my backyard door was. 
I just peeped my head, just opposite the kitchen sink, at the end of the island counter, where I can have a good view of the back door. And from what I could see, the doorknob was not moving at all. From what I could see, but possible the outside doorknob was, because I knew the sound of the doorknob moving. Someone or something was shaking or rattling the doorknob from the outside. I left it alone, still scared at this point, and went back to working on my essay. The rattling and shaking of the doorknob is not stopping, and slowly getting a little louder as I continue to work. It's been about five minutes since I started hearing the doorknob shaking, and I'm really scared at this point. So I decided to go to bed and wake up early tomorrow to work on my essay. So I turned off the lights and went straight to bed. A mere five minutes has probably passed since I turned off the lights and went to bed. As I'm laying in bed thinking about what just happened and what I need to write next in the essay, I realized I didn't hear the doorknob rattling anymore. It suddenly stopped. So I decided to get back up because I had to finish this essay and I'm still wide awake. So I turn on the light and continue to work on my essay. Not even a minute had passed since I turned on the light and the doorknob was shaking very intensely and violently all of a sudden. The loudest I've ever heard it this night and I was even more scared and turned off the lights and went straight to bed. I live in the UK and come from a town that was first settled by Romans for context. It's a very historical area. When I was a child, I lived in a house built in the early 1800s. The whole street was built to house the fishermen of the time. Before that, I understood it was farmland. It was from four years of age, I would start getting these dreams of someone in a wheelchair, deformed and tormenting me. It was a nightly occurrence and made me cry and shriek for my brother. It soon ended after a couple of years. However, this is when I started to see things whilst I was awake. And one of them really did make me freeze every time without fail. It started when I was lying in my bottom bunk bed and I would turn over and look and see on the other side of the room, two cat's heads fighting to get past each other near the bookshelf. This happened often and I just shrugged it off eventually. But one night, I'll never forget the first time. I saw a lady lying on my bedroom floor, right near that same bookshelf, absolutely motionless, no movements, nothing. I was too scared to move the first few times I encountered her. I eventually plucked the courage to stand up and properly look. She looked weathered, wearing a drab and beaten looking dress robe and hair wild and untamed. I could make out much of the face, but it just looked empty. I would turn on the lights and she would be gone. The moment I turned it back off, I would see her there again, lying in front of the bookshelf. The most frightening night was when I awoke to see her lying there, in the usual spot, accompanied by some unnatural noises and a fatigued breathing sound I will never forget. It was as if she was trying to breathe with liquid iron in her lungs. I never screamed so hard and cried at the same time in my life. My mother said I was being ridiculous the entire time, but my brother saw the sincerity in my eyes. So fast forward when I'm older and we're moving house. My mum got a local surveyor in to get the property done. Anyway, he came up to my room whilst I was boxing up and we started chatting. I then joked about how I would see that lady and sometimes the cat near the bookshelves. He then jokes, oh, you do realize there's a fireplace built in the wall where your bookcase is, right? I said, okay, and? He looked at me a bit dumbfounded for a bit and changed the subject. I then asked why he mentioned the fireplace and he stopped. He told me not to be alarmed and not to take it to heart, and even said he doesn't believe in ghosts or anything, but continued that in the late 1800s, someone in one of the houses on the street had locked up a relative. I'm very vague on this part because I can't quite remember the conversation due to the sheer fright and fear going through me at the time, in their room, and left them to starve after they went mad. Allegedly, the woman lit the fire and died from smoke inhalation. Apparently someone in a wheelchair had died in the house prior to us moving in as well. I have no clue if any of that was true. I could only find a few references in local papers from archives about ob or obituaries, 
in the area, but nothing about causes of death, etc. But it's just always been in my head. So I was driving up north with my mom to visit my grandparents. It's a two day trip, so we had stopped in a motel. Nothing was out of the ordinary, and the motel was pretty nice for such a remote area. I went to sleep and dreamed I was at my grandparents' house, and that it was haunted. Before this, I had recurring dreams where one specific room of their house was haunted, but I had never dreamt of any entity in particular. I just saw things move on their own, had the blankets ripped off of me, and heard unintelligible whispering until I woke up. This dream was different. It was the same room, and it started off just as terrifying as the others. But then I discovered that the entity was a teenage boy who had been murdered. I'm a teenage girl, and we sat in the room and spoke just like any two teenagers would. At one point in the dream, I went down to get a drink. And when I came back in the room, the door slammed behind me. I jumped and screamed a little, but he was standing in front of the door laughing, and I told him to cut it out. It was just so normal, like I was talking to a friend from school or something. But I'd never seen this kid before in my life. By the end of the dream, we were quite familiar with each other, and he confided how lonely I was since he had died to me. How he missed his friends and worried about them, and how he couldn't tell them what happened to him, or what death was like. I did my best to comfort him, and he asked if he could show me where he died. I said okay. And he touched my head, and I saw him lying in a pile of trash or recycling, blood on his face and blood accumulating around his head, his clothes dirty and his eyes blank. It only lasted a couple of seconds, and when I came to, I just looked at him and didn't say anything. I took his hand in mine and we just sat there on the bed looking at ourselves in the old vanity mirror. Then I woke up. I have a lot of weird and vivid dreams, so I wasn't on edge when I woke up. I didn't even mention it to my mom. We got back on the road and I started playing video games again. Then we pulled into a rest stop in the middle of the forest. At this point, we were pretty far from the town we'd slept in, and the next town was where my grandparents lived. The only other people who lived around there lived on Indian reserves, and you couldn't hide a person there. They're way too small. I get out of the car to stretch my legs, and while I'm walking to the bathroom, I see a couple of missing posters taped to the trash bin. And there he is, roughly the same age, same hair, same clothes, same fucking name. When we got back into the car, I told my mom and she believed me, yet wasn't surprised in the slightest. She had always believed strongly in the paranormal and had told me lots of stories from her life. Once her house had been robbed when she was a young girl and as soon as she walked in, she went upstairs straight to where the robber had left his watch. My mom also does this thing where every month or so, she'll stop whatever we're doing, cover her eyes with her hands and tell me she's dreamt the moments we're in now. She told me in the car that every woman in her family has had strange things like this happen to them and it usually comes about in teenagerhood. I'm 16. I don't know if I really believe her. I mean, I believe what's happened to her and my grandma and all my aunts, but I don't know. I didn't think it could actually happen to me. I've recently asked her about a dream I had when I was around three or four, and she told me it wasn't a dream, that it actually happened. And then I asked my sister separately, and she told me the same thing. I was sitting on my sister's bed and she was holding a stack of go fish cards face down and I was guessing what they were and every time I got it right before she flipped them over. My mom was sitting in a chair watching us. She was very calm and that's why I thought it was a dream. Also, you know, that shit's impossible. But considering what my mom said, it makes sense she wouldn't be surprised. My parents bought this house in the late 80s, with one previous owner who bought it when it was new. I do not know of any deaths, murders or issues with the property. It's a 1,000 square foot home 
with a basement that is the size of the entire house. When you walk in the front door, you're in the living room and can see directly into the kitchen. To the right at the entrance of the kitchen, there's a hallway that has all three bedrooms and one small bathroom at the end. If you walk through the kitchen, on the very back left side, there's a basement door. These details will help when trying to picture these stories. Story one. When I was around eight years old, our neighbor's daughter would watch us on occasion. We'll call her Kelly. She was 16 or 17 at the time. I have a younger brother who's three years younger than me. We were all in the living room playing hide and seek when we heard this ringing coming from the basements. The ringing sounded like a phone. It was like one of those old phones that would make a ton of noise and had a rotary dial. I asked my mom and she said later that we did not own one and there definitely wasn't a phone in the basements. So we hear this ringing and Kelly decides to go check and see what it is. She goes back and opens the basement door and it stops completely. She brushes it off and comes back. About 30 minutes later, we hear the ringing again. We listened to her for five minutes or so to make sure we weren't nuts. She went to the basement door again, bless her, and it stopped as soon as she opened the door. She started to panic a little, but tried to play it off to not scare us. It started ringing again after like 20 minutes and lasted for about 10 because she didn't go back to the door to see what it was. Story two. I was in my bedroom playing games late at night when I was about 14. I was the kid that stayed up all night during the summer and slept all day. It was probably 4 a.m. or so. I decided I was thirsty and went into the kitchen for some water. It was pitch black because I didn't want to wake my family. Our bedrooms are all grouped together. I go down the hallway and make it right into the kitchen. And all of a sudden I smell this strong baby powder smell. It was like someone had dumped it on me. I paused for a second to be sure I wasn't imagining it. I then took a step back and could not smell it at all. I then took the step forward again and the smell hit me so hard it scared me to death. I ran as fast as I could back to my room. The next morning I asked my mom if anyone she ever knew smelled like baby powder and she said my great grandmother always smelled like it. Her words like she had poured it on herself every morning. Really freaky. Story three. This was the most intense of all experiences I've ever had. I was a little older, 17 or so at the time. I was alone at home. Background info. We had an air hockey table that had a broken on off switch. So in order to use it, you had to plug it in manually every time. My mom was very particular about the air hockey table looking neat when we were done. So we put all the pucks on the ends neatly. There's a vent in the bathroom that leads directly to the basement, so you can hear everything. Anyways, I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth when I hear the clack 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 of the pucks hitting the side of the table and the air running on it. It was pretty loud when on. I was like, what? And went to the basement door to look down. You could see directly to the table from the top of the steps. It was on plugged in and the pucks were all over the place. I called out to my brother who didn't answer because I was alone, thinking maybe he came home early. No response. I thought maybe he left it on and went downstairs to fix it. I unplugged it, wrapped the cord around my leg and placed the pucks back because my mum would have been upset. I go back upstairs and mind my business for like an hour when I have to use the restroom. I go in there, sit and hear the table going through the vent again. I could hear clearly that the pucks were moving. I'll never forget that. Now I'm pretty freaked. I slink back to the basement door and open it. Flip the light on. The table is plugged in and running, and everything is out of place again. Bro. I go down again. I am stupid. What is wrong with me? And fix it all. I come back up, go to my room for like 10 minutes, go to the bathroom to see if I could hear it, and it's going again. I didn't go back down there until the next day. I got in trouble for leaving it on all night. I had something like that happen once. 
I was working in a restaurant that specialises in noodles and was on my lunch break. We had just finished lunch rush and had gotten everything ready for dinner. It was around 2.30pm and I was sitting at the bar facing the front, eating lunch, and the cook came over and sat with me. About 10 minutes later, as both of us were sitting there, my boss came running from the back of the restaurant out to where we were eating. She went through the dining room and then came over to the cook and I. She asked where the customer was. We both looked at each other and then said no one has been in for 20 minutes. She then says to us, I was working at the desk and looked out the window, but I noticed a customer standing in front of the register. I figured she took care of them, but looked back five minutes later and the customer was still standing there. That's when I came out to look for the customer and then ream you two out. The customer is gone. We once again told her no one has been in for 20 minutes. We would also get customers reporting they saw a small child out of the corner of their eye, run into the ladies' restroom unsupervised. The customer would then get up and go look for the kid, and the kid was never there. This happened at least twice a week at all different times. The street in front of the restaurant was getting repaved at night, so there was a construction crew outside from 10pm to 6am. After about a week of construction, a crew member came into the restaurant to ask what our hours are. I told him 11am to 9pm Sunday through Thursday and 11am to 10pm Friday and Saturday night. He said, that's what I thought, but you have people in your restaurant at 2am. I said we should not and he was sure he noticed them twice last week. I asked the gentleman if he could wait for five minutes as I went to the back to check the security tape. Lo and behold, no one on the tape at 2am. I showed the gentleman the tape. After he watched it, he did the sign of the cross and ran out the restaurant. I'm sensitive to spirits and can often see them. It scares me when they're around, even though much of the time they're just hanging out. I've had some experiences that have gone further than that. We own a house that was built in 1865 that was a church parsonage. We have two spirits that live here. A young woman with long dark hair and a white gown that we often forget is here. I actually haven't seen her for years, though my daughter has seen her often. The other spirit is not a nice one. He lives in my computer room. He won't allow anyone to sleep in that room. On occasions I've tried, he'll either nudge me awake every half hour or he'll induce nightmares. And one time, he appeared to me with a very angry twisted face and screamed, GET OUT! There was one night that frightened me so bad, I haven't even tried to nap in that room since. I was sleeping and the spirits grabbed what I can only assume was my soul and shoved me into the corner of the room. He started applying pressure to every part of my body. I was struggling to breathe or speak. Every time I tried to say something, he'd apply more pressure. It was really starting to hurt. As I struggled against him, he applied more pressure and I pictured my mother. I wanted to call out to her no matter how much effort it took. I opened my mouth and I managed to speak out, Grand... Oh. That wasn't what I wanted to say, but it's what came out. And the moment I said the last syllable, I was wide awake on the bed, gasping for breath, my lungs and body hurting. I left the room and didn't go back in there. I believe my grandmother, who died eight years ago, saved me. I know some may say I was sleeping, having a nightmare, sleep paralysis or whatever, but I know otherwise because of other experiences I've had with this spirit. I've seen him several times when I'm wide awake and just working on my computer. Even my children have seen him. That isn't what this thread is about though. I used to think all pets, especially cats, could see spirits. This past weekend, I learned only one of my five cats can see them. His name is Marley. I work the night shift and he's often in the living room with me. Sometimes he'll stop whatever he's doing to stare intently at something. Sometimes it's a bug and I can tell because his eyes will dart all over the place. But when he stares at one spot without moving, I know it's a spirit. I typically don't worry about it too much and I don't open up my awareness to them because I don't want to know they're really there. 
But this past weekend was one that freaked me out because my cat was scared. He was doing that staring thing, but his tail was puffed up four times its normal size. I thought he was looking at a moving paper or something in my husband's computer room. So I closed the door, but my cat didn't stop. And he was still staring at the same spot in front of my husband's computer room. I shared videos of it with a friend who told me to pick him up and bring him to where he was looking. When I tried that, my cat hissed and clawed me to get down. I was very out of character for him. He continued to stare in that one spot. Then whatever he was looking at must have moved down the hall. I wanted to know what was there, so I shielded myself and reached out with my awareness. And I saw a tall, pale man in a black trench coat standing in front of the entrance to our home at the end of the hall, unmoving and just watching me. Half of me think it's my imagination, but the other half knows better. My friend told me I should ask him to leave. I just wanted to leave it alone and let it be on its way in its own time. But my cat was becoming increasingly agitated, tail puffed up, and now the fur on his back was standing up. He kept staring at it. I decided, fine, I'll ask it to leave. Feeling silly, because I didn't really believe there was a spirit there. So I made a big show of telling it that it doesn't belong here. This is my home, and he needs to leave. I was walking down the hall as I said that, practically laughing at myself for being so silly. And when I got to the final part about him needing to leave, I reached the spot where I saw he was standing and pointed out the door. It felt like I walked into a cold cloud. I heard a buzzing noise in my ears, pressure on my head, and static electricity that caused the hair all along my neck and back to stand up. Very freaky feeling. Then I saw this spirit turn into a black cloud and go out the door. Almost immediately, my cat calmed down. He glanced at that spot a couple of times at first, but he was more interested in being pet, playing with a box, or just lying down for a nap. I knew the spirit was gone. I had at least two other cats and my chihuahua in the room, and none of them reacted to the spirit or gave any indication of seeing it. So much for taking comfort in my pets alerting me when something is around. When I shared this story with my mom and husband the next day, my 16-year-old daughter got really excited and said, You finally saw him? I've been seeing him off and on since I was nine. That's when I recalled my daughter wanting to sleep with a light on, or wanting to sleep with us, because she was seeing this spirit standing in her room, watching her sleep. I had a very strange dream one night when I was living in Colorado. In the dream, I was sitting on my bed back home in Guam. I was humming and reading a book to myself, something I do almost every day. After a few minutes, I decided that I wanted to go to my parents' room. I got off the bed and walked across the end of the hallway with heavy footsteps to my parents' bedroom door. As usual, the door was closed. I wrapped my right hand around the doorknob and tried to turn it. It was locked. For some reason, I really wanted to enter their room. I turned the doorknob back and forth, but it wouldn't budge. My stubborn dream self was not accepting that the door was locked. I placed my left hand over my right hand and shook the door with all my strength. It still didn't open. I gave up after a few seconds, released my tight grip from the doorknob and clumsily walked down the hallway towards the kitchen. I don't remember ever reaching the kitchen before waking up. I looked at my alarm clock. It was five o'clock in the morning. I went back to sleep. I was on the phone with my parents the following evening, Colorado time, when they told me about a strange experience they had the night before, Guam time. They were watching TV. The aircon was on in their bedroom, so they made sure to close the door. My mom quickly moved to the TV as she heard a strange noise coming from my bedroom. My parents are empty nesters, so there should not be anyone in the house but them. Then they heard heavy footsteps walk out of my bedroom, across the hallway and towards their door. The doorknob began to slowly turn on its own. There was a brief pause before it turned again a few more times. All of a sudden, the door began to shake violently. The shaking ceased after several seconds. The heavy footsteps moved from the other side of their door 
down the hall and towards the kitchen. When did this happen? I asked as my heart began to race and my breath became shallow. This was around 10 last night, my mom replied. 10 p.m. in Guam? It would have been 5 a.m. in Colorado. For a span of 18 months, from March 2012 to September 2013, I would experience a disturbing recurring dream almost every night. I would either have this dream or no memorable dream at all. The brief events and surrounding details of the dream were always exactly the same without any variation. Seven years later, I can still recall this dream as if I've just awoken from it. In the dream, I'm sitting in the driver's seat of a vehicle, looking through the eyes of a tall driver. I know I'm not the driver because I look down and to the right and see myself sitting in the front passenger seat. We're talking and laughing. The conversation and laughter in the dream are muffled and distant, like voices underwater. Through the eyes of the driver, I look past myself in the passenger seat, through the front passenger window, and see a mass approaching at high velocity. The colour and shape of the mass are indeterminate, shifting and flowing through a spectrum of light and space that my mind cannot comprehend. The mass is quickly becoming larger and larger. Suddenly and violently, the mass collides with the front passenger side of the vehicle. This immense kinetic energy surges through my body, as if the convulsions of a massive earthquake have been condensed into a single moment, encasing me and penetrating me. Glass implodes from multiple directions like a bomb. The barrier constructed from protection transforms into a sea of shrapnel, sending thousands of tiny sharp teeth to bite and tear and rip and stab at every inch of my skin. The metal frame of the vehicle begins to collapse and rotate, as if it's nothing more than paper to be crumbled and tossed away. The space around me is becoming smaller and whirling faster, like the motion of an endless roller coaster. My eyes never close and I never look away from the passenger seat. I see myself lurch forward as, it, as if I weigh less than air. My face collides with the dashboard, the airbag never deploys. I woke up. For 18 months, I've had this dream. For 18 months, I become more stressed and more anxious. I see the dream when I sleep. I see the dream when I'm awake. I couldn't be in the front passenger seat of any vehicle without feeling my blood pressure rise. It gets to the point where I'm even scared to fall asleep for fear of seeing the event of the dream. In September 2013, I had the dream for the last time. One day passes, one week passes, one month passes. I still do not have the dream. I don't even question this because I'm so happy to be able to sleep again and not feel fear any time I'm in a vehicle. I feel that long, strange and terrible period is finally past me. Two months later, on a beautiful day in November 2013, I was working at the visitor center of the National Wildlife Refuge where I had been employed for a little over two years. It's a slow day at work and not many people are coming into the building. The tropical beach is far more interesting than our display murals and informational plaques. I take advantage of this slowness and spend my time reading. Mid-morning arrives and I hear the chime of the front door ring as soft footsteps enter the visitor centre. I look up from my book and see a young couple who seem to be in their early to mid-thirties. I greet them, but they don't notice me in the distance. I return my gaze to my book as their attention is drawn to our murals and plaques. Some time passes before I hear a soft, feminine voice politely say, Excuse me, from the opposite side of the court, counter. Yes, I respond as I look up and smile to meet the eyes of the young woman. But as soon as I face her, her expression very quickly changes from inquiry to shock. She immediately turns to walk away. Without saying another word, she walks from the counter to the wall about five meters away. Her husband, presumably sensing her discomfort, walks up to her and puts his arm around her shoulders. They're talking in whispers that I cannot hear. She's visibly upset about something. I think this is very strange at first, but ultimately it's none of my business. I look away from them so that they don't feel judged or observed. 
Many minutes pass and the woman returns to the counter. Her face is a bit puffy and her eyes are a little red. She takes a quick, deep breath and proceeds to ask me about the free cave tours available to visitors of the refuge. Without hesitation, I begin to describe the tour. About two minutes pass and she breaks down into full tears. She's crying heavily as her husband rushes back to her side. I'm so sorry, was there something I said? Of all I can think to say this moment. She wipes her face with the tissues I hand her before taking a breath and speaking again. She apologises. I reassure her that there's nothing to apologise for. What she shares with me is something that will stick with me for the rest of my life. She attended university in Australia and lived there for 10 years. In her decade there, her best friend, a woman who became her sister, looked and spoke exactly like me. She was my complete doppelganger. Two months earlier, in September 2013, her best friend was involved in a major car accident. Another driver had hit her friend's side of the vehicle. The airbag never deployed and she died instantly. My heart begins to race and every ounce of air seems to empty from my lungs. After some time and comforting from her husband, the woman asks if they can go on the cave tour. Of course, I responded. We go on our tour and return to the visitor centre over an hour later. The woman tells me of their plans for the rest of their trip. After a brief silence, she reaches out and gives me a deep hug. Goodbye, 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 she keeps, repeating slowly in a soft, forlorn whisper, as she holds me in a warm embrace. I'm not the hugging type of person, but I realise that it's not me she's reaching out for. I let her stay there for as long as needed, returning her hug. After a while, she lets go. She doesn't look at my face as she turns and walks away. The woman and her husband take each other's hand and walk out the door. I never saw them again.